my background is uh, in undergraduate. I did um, electrical engineering and um, also took several computer science courses. Um, in graduate school, I did experimental work, so building electron spin based quantum computers, so different components for them. Um, when you work with electron spins, you need to be a bit more specific about what kind of physical system is your electron spin qubit system. <clears throat> so the system that I work with the most is the phosphorus donor in, um, in silicon. So if you take a piece of silicon, uh, try to get it as clean as possible, so pure silicon, um, and then put in phosphorus atoms. Phosphorus has five valence electrons, silicon has four, so phosphorus can insert itself into an array of silica, uh, silicon and have one extra electron, which you can use as your sort of free qubit. Um, it's, it's slightly attached to the phosphorus donor, so it's not freely moving around like you'd see in a metal, but it's still bound enough that you can work with it as a, as a qubit. And so my work was involved in trying to make sure that as you're working with electron spin qubits, one of the things that you need to do is apply these magnetic fields to get a splitting between the spin up and spin down energy levels. So the higher the magnetic field, the larger the splitting between zero and one. However, magnetic fields are very hard to get stable. So what we found is that for very long coherence times, when your qubits are alive for a very long time, because the energy level splitting is dependent on the magnetic field, as the magnetic field fluctuates, if the magnetic field is moving up and down, the spin energy levels are also fluctuating. And as a result, the, the energy difference between the spin energy levels. And as a result, you start acquiring these phases, which are very similar to the kinds of phases that we discussed today. Um, and so what that means is you don't have a qubit that you have full control over anymore, right? So the qubit is getting rotations from the environmental fluctuations on top of what you're trying to do. So the idea was how do we stabilize the magnetic fields to a quiet enough level? I'm talking about part per billion level fluctuations here. How do you stabilize magnetic fields at the part per billion level so that you get an, a stable enough environment to do your um, quantum computing experiments? So that's one set of things that I did in graduate school. The other question is, how do you even measure um, electron spin qubits? One of the really nice ways to do this is using a technique called electron spin resonance. And you can increase the sensitivity of electron spin resonance by using superconducting resonators. So I, I fabricated several different kinds of resonators to do spin readout and got some experience doing clean room work. So that I think is one of my favorite things about graduate school. Uh, and finally, one of the really cool qubits uh, that's not as popular as superconducting qubits, I should say, is, um, is electrons floating on superfluid helium. It's a very exotic system. Um, it's an interesting system. So you literally have a superfluid uh, layer of helium and an electron hovering roughly 10 nanometers above that surface of helium. And that electron can be moved around uh, with gates underneath, so using voltages, and you can manipulate its spin to do your quantum computing. So think about this as a qubit that you can use, except that qubit is mobile, you can move it. So with superconducting qubits, for example, you have a chip, you pattern the superconducting qubits on the chip, that's it, you're done. You can't move the qubit, right? You need coupling between the qubits in order to do, for example, entangling gates. With electrons on helium, a nice thing that you can do is you can move two electrons close to each other, turn on an interaction, and then move them apart. So now they're independent systems. So working in that direction and making devices to control electrons on helium was the kind of work that I did uh, near the end. So I hope that gives you a quick kind of idea. If you're asking how I learned about quantum algorithms in all of this, um, I was a teaching assistant for quantum algorithms uh, courses. And so I, uh, I was very lucky to get that opportunity because it forced me to learn it uh, in the process of also teaching it. And that's also why I think um, it's exciting to share it with all of you because this is an exciting field and I love to share the experience of quantum algorithms and kind of the deeper understanding that you get about the world from learning these quantum algorithms. Okay. Uh, let's. Pause here for a second and uh, I'll just 
switch my screen. Uh, and Susie, if you could help me, we can go back to the Shores algorithm discussion. You got it. Thank you, Susie. Yes, perfect. I can see it on the screen. Thank you, Susie. You're welcome. OK, so time for Shor's algorithm, right? This is kind of the moment uh, we've all been building up to. So let's, uh, let's write it down. So let's say we're about to talk about Shor's algorithm. The goal of Shor's algorithm uh, and this is something that uh, this is something that got a lot of people excited and um, maybe even realized the power of quantum computing. The problem you're trying to solve is the following, and we've already discussed this before. Uh, we're trying to factor a number, and the kind of number that we're trying to factor is something that looks like n equals p times q, where P and Q are prime and large. So this is the goal of um, doing uh, Shor's algorithm is to hopefully be able to factor numbers. Now, this, this problem is classically a very difficult problem to work with. So classically, and every time you hear someone say, this is a hard problem classically. Really what they're saying is, this is a hard problem to do on the computers that we have today, the classical computers that work with zeros and ones. Classically, this problem uh, in the worst case looks like uh, the following. We already discussed this. So it's some exponential of something like n to the power of one third and some more factors out here. And Shor's algorithm, the reason it got so many people excited uh, is that it does this a little faster with, with some prefactors, a little faster than O of n cube. So notice there's no more exponential here. Uh, and this is why people are quite excited about it, this, because this is a speed up that's, um, that's exponential. So these. So let me remind you again. This classical, um, this classical worst case uh, dependence on n. N is number of bits needed to describe the factors. And so as the size of the problem grows, um, you can see the difficulty of solving the problem also grows exponentially. So this is the promise of Shor's algorithm, and this is why so many people are excited about it. Now, my, my expectation is that after you learn all of this, you'll probably look through the literature and maybe even see how others have done similar work. The hardest thing about learning um, Shor's algorithm is the sheer amount of number theory that you see in the literature. That can be overwhelming when you learn it the first time. So let me, let me maybe give you a very quick primer on uh, modular arithmetic, because I don't think there's any way to avoid um, talking about modular arithmetic as you're doing Shor's algorithm. And you'll probably also see this in the literature. So it's a good thing to go through very quickly. So let's do a quick primer on modular arithmetic. So just very, very quick primer, let's, uh, let's do the following. So if you divide five by three, this is a very simple thing to do, right? The quotient is one, and the remainder is two. This is the kind of thing that, um, that we learned very early on, five divided by three, you multiply once, three goes in here, and you get remainder two. The way to write this down uh, in, in sort of a formal way is to say, so five is here and two is down here. That's the remainder. So five is equivalent to two modulo three. 
is the way to express this relationship between the two. Okay, so five and two are equivalent in, in modulo, um, modulo three. Uh, the, the reason why this is the case will become very clear when I show you the following. So let's say X is the following number. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. If I said modulo 3, what is X equivalent to? So remember the number that we're looking for is the remainder when you divide by the number that we said modulo of. So the remainder when you divide by one is one. The remainder when you divide by two, the, when you divide uh, two by three is two. The remainder when you divide, uh, when you divide three is zero. And the same cycle will repeat. You'll get four divided by three, remainder one. Five divided by three, remainder two. 6 divided by 3, remainder 0. And this, this will keep repeating. So notice how x is equivalent to numbers 1 up to the number that we're saying modulo of. So 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, and so on. So I'll explicitly write that down by telling you, notice, x is equivalent to 0 modulo 3. If we say that, it's any of these numbers, right? So what does that mean? That means x is a multiple of 3. OK. If x is 1, equivalent to 1 modulo 3, what does that mean? It's one of these numbers. And what does that mean? It's x is a multiple of 3 plus 1, right? Plus 1. A multiple of 3 plus 1. And more generally, if I say x is equivalent to y, modulo 3, what I mean is x is a multiple of 3, so 3 times k plus y for some integer k. So this is, uh, this, is the, this is the important thing to keep in mind when you write down modular arithmetic. When you say two things are equivalent, modulo something, it means they're different by up to a factor of a multiple of modulo, that modulo that you're looking for. So that's the first order of business. The second order of business that I would like you to notice, and this is the insight in Shor's algorithm, is the following. Um, so notice the periodicity of modular arithmetic. And when I say periodicity, what does that mean? I mean here, for example, when we did modulo 3, you have the same numbers repeating, right? You had 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 0, and so on. If we say x is equivalent to y modulo n, what does that mean? It means y is some number from 0 all the way up to n. So n minus 1, in fact. In other words, for example, for the concrete example that we put above, if we said x is equivalent to y modulo 3, means y can be any of 0, 1, or 2. So that's, that's the key, uh, key thing to note about what these values can possibly be. OK, so now that you've seen uh, modular arithmetic, the question uh, becomes, how do we factor numbers? And uh, this, is, this is the key insight of Shor's algorithm. How do we factor two numbers? Uh, how do we factor two numbers out of one big number that we're given if we're told that it has two prime factors? So this is the insight that led to Shor's algorithm and why so many people are excited about it. 
So Shor's algorithm says the following. I'll write down in a different color. The protocol for Shor's algorithm. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start by writing down the following. So we're going to pick a number A. So remember, again, the goal here is we're trying to find the prime factors of a number N is P times Q. We're going to pick a number A. And the condition on how we pick this number is that it has to be co-prime with N. So pick a number A that is co-prime with N. What does that mean, co-prime with N? That means they don't share any common divisors. Uh, so for example, if, it's, if the number that you're trying to factor is 15, you can't pick another number that has the factors 3 and 5 inside it. So for example, you can't pick a number 10 because one of the factors of 10 is five and you share that with 15. So Shor's algorithm tells us pick a, five, pick a number, uh, pick a number that's co-prime with, uh, with N and then says, find the order R of the function a to the r modulo n. Now, every time, uh, every time you hear someone say the order in the literature, uh, the order is simply the period of this function. So if you have this function, a to the r modulo n, just like I showed you before, how do you, how do you, how do you find that period? So what Shor's algorithm is telling us is that if we can find that period, that period r, then we have a very good chance of finding those factors. Now, strictly speaking, the definition of the order R is the smallest R such that A to the R, Rth power, is equivalent to one modulo N. Why is this the case? Let me take you back to the example that we had. So if you look at these numbers, for example, you see the periodicity, right? So you're looking for the first time the number clicks back to one. And that allows you to find the period, right? So the difference between these two is the period that you're looking for. Okay, so Shor's algorithm then tells us the following. If R is even, then that's good news because what we can do is move on to the next step. Now let's define a new variable. It's R o a to the power of R over two modulo N again. If this X, the new number that we defined is not equivalent to zero modulo N, then that's even better news because now we have a situation where the factors P and Q that we're looking for, one of them is contained in the following. So the GCD, the greatest common uh, divisor of X plus one and N and X minus one and n. If any of these systems fail, so these ifs that we did, the else condition is just go find another a, pick another a, and start over again. So this is this is Shor's algorithm um, in a nutshell. The first time I learned this, uh, it it kind of seemed magical that all of this works. And so I think it's a very good exercise for all of us to go together through all of this um, in detail by factoring the number 15, okay? 
I'll show you how to factor the number 15 at this point, but before I continue, let me just make sure everyone's on the same page here. Just some, some important terms to clear up. GCD, again, I'll write down, is the greatest common divisor. And that means, for example, if you have two numbers, say 10 and 15, their factors are, for 10, for example, it's 1 and 2 and 5 and 10. And for 15, it's 1 and 3 and 5 and 15. So the greatest common divisor, the divisor that they have in common, and the greatest one among those is 5. What I'm saying uh, here is that I'm looking for the greatest common divisor of x plus 1 and n and x minus 1 and n. So that's, uh, that's, the, that's the condition that we're trying to match. And remember, in order to go through all of this, we have to go through a situation where if r is even, and if x plus one is not, equal, is not equivalent to zero modulo n, these are the conditions that we need to satisfy, okay? Let me pause here very quickly before I move on to the concrete example of 15 and see if there are any questions. Hey, Abe. Um, so there are a few questions. Um, I'm not sure if this was from, from earlier content, but if it is, maybe we want to come back to it. Um, I'll let you sure. decide. So sure. is there a good interpretation of the Fourier basis, something analogous to frequency basis, perhaps? To the what basis? I'm sorry, you broke up. Uh, the just... Fourier basis. Mm -hmm. so, uh, the so... Is, do you need me to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay. Is there a good interpretation of the Fourier basis, something an analogous to frequency basis, perhaps? Yeah, so that's a good way, uh, that's a good question. And thank you, Susie, for um, reading it again. Uh, the way I think about the Fourier basis is as a way of encoding information in phases. This is not something purely quantum. We do the same thing with um, discrete Fourier transforms and general Fourier transforms. It's just that now we're taking advantage of the phase information that's available in quantum computing. So I think we can, we can move on from that question um, and maybe even answer one more question before doing the example. Um, I think we're okay for now. Again, I'll just remind everybody that if it's a question um, that a bunch of people need answered, please use the upvote feature. Um, and I am seeing that some of the participants are also answering questions here, which is great. So um, great. I think we're all set to move on. But again, uh, upvote the questions. And if I'm missing something, please just uh, signal to me in the chat or you know maintain that upvote. Okay, thank you, Susie. Yep. Okay, so let's do a concrete example. Uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a good example to see. And um, Susie, I'll just give you a heads up. In a couple of minutes, I'll need to share my screen. So I'll probably give you a signal that I'm about to share my screen and maybe we can bring the screen um, front and center. Okay. Uh, but for now, let's do the following. So let's go through a concrete example. And let's factor 15. Okay, so Let's let's factor 15. Now remember 15 is in binary 1111, so it's four bits. Okay, let's do the first step. What do the steps tell us? Step one, pick a number A that is co-prime with N. Pick a number that's co-prime with 15. I'm going to go with, let's say 13, okay? So step one, pick a number that is co-prime with 15, I'll pick 13. So what does that mean? We have A equals 13. Okay, step two. Find the order R of the function A to the power of R modulo N. What does that mean? That means find the period of a to the power of r, so 13 to the power of r modulo 15. Okay, 
Uh, so generally, let's let's write down what this means. 13 to the power of some number modulo 15. I'm going to say, let's say that number is x. Let's say x is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, going all the way down to um, larger numbers. And I'll say 13 to the r, to 13 to the x modulo 15. OK. What is that? 13 to the power of 0 modulo 15 is just 1 modulo 15, and that's 1. 13 to the power of 1 modulo 15 is exactly 13. 13 to the power of 2 modulo 15, if you just uh, use a quick calculator to find this, it's 169 modulo 15. And you'll find that the remainder there is, um, you'll find that the, the, the remainder there is 4. And 13 to the power of 3 modulo 15 is what? 7. 13 to the power of 4 modulo 15 is 1. And the first time you see 1, remember, that's when it starts repeating. So this is, thir this is 13, this is 4, this is 7, and so on. And I encourage you to go through this exercise and find the numbers. So take a look at this. We had one here and one here. So the smallest number, remember, we defined R as smallest number, such that A to the power of R modulo N is equivalent to 1. So let's write that down properly. A to the power of R is equivalent to 1 modulo N. And in our case, that number is 4. So r is 4. OK. That's a very useful piece of information to have. What does step 3 say? Step 3 says if r is even, OK, that's good news. r is indeed even. Then we need to compute x plus 1, right, where x is this number a to the power of r over 2 modulo n. What is x? x is a to the power of r over 2 modulo n. What is that? That's uh, a is 13 to the power of r over 2 is 4 over 2 modulo 15. And what is that? That's 4 modulo 15. So what does the condition say? If x plus 1 is not equal to 0 modulo n. Right, so what is x plus one? x plus one is four plus one, and that's five. And that's equivalent to five modulo 15, right? Nothing changes there. That's not equal to zero. So we're ready to go into the last condition. If all of these conditions are met, Shor's algorithm tells us that P or Q, one of those, will be contained in GCDF x plus one comma n and x minus one comma n. So the next step is to do the greatest common divisor of x plus 1 comma n and x minus 1 comma n. What does this mean? It's the greatest common divisor of x plus 1, which is 5 comma n. What does this one mean? It's the GCD of x minus 1, 3 comma 15. And the greatest common divisor of both of these is 5 and 3. And those are the factors of 15. So as you can see here, P and Q we found to be 5 and 3. And this is the power of Shor's algorithm. So big picture, the main takeaway that I want all of you to take from this lecture is that this is how Shor's algorithm works. What we've done in doing all of this, this manipulation of the numbers is turn the problem of factoring which you would never expect to be one of these problems that has anything to do with periodicity, we've turned it into a problem that has to do with periodicity. And in fact, what we're trying to do is solve the period of this, uh, this function, a to the r, uh, uh, so a to the r modulo n. By finding the period of that function, we've been able to factor two numbers. And that is why Shor's algorithm works. And that's the key insight, turning a problem of 
uh, factoring into a problem of period finding. And so at this point, I would encourage you to pause for a second. Um, if you're wondering why, let's go back to the very beginning of this lecture, why we call this lecture Shor's algorithm from factoring to period finding, this is, this is, why, uh, this is why we're going to uh, go through all of these materials. So now that I've shown you that I can turn the factoring problem into a period finding problem, it shouldn't be surprising that the next step is probably going to involve in some way the quantum Fourier transform. It may not be clear how, but I think it's important to be able to, um, to keep that insight, right? To be able to find periodicity, just like we saw yesterday. Okay, so let's go back to the very end uh, where we were, and I'll pause here for any questions. Hey, Abe. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is, uh, Sorry, let me get to the question. Could you please explain the thinking process behind creating algorithms? How do you come up with certain problems and how you think that a certain problem is solvable using quantum computing? This seems to be heavily upvoted. Um, the, the mind or, or the thought process seems to say, uh, this will help us in the future if we want to contribute to the community. Mm -hmm. So the insight of what kinds of problems can be solved on a quantum computer is is actually not one of these things that's very easy to explain and in fact that difficulty is why there are so few crown jewel algorithms in the field uh the issue of really understanding how quantum algorithms work that boils down to seeing a situation where you can encode information in um, superposition and entanglement and find a way to interfere, uh, interfere quantum states so that you can get the final answer to collapse in the direction that you want. The, the insight between that tells you which algorithms to work with is actually very, very difficult to kind of put into words. And in fact, if that insight was clear, there would be many more algorithms. But one thing that seems to be relevant is that we now have building blocks like the quantum Fourier transform, uh, quantum phase estimation, and there are algorithms um, that seem to be uh, that seem to be sort of directed in the direction of optimization. So there are many different components to solving an optimization problem, where quantum computers can potentially provide some benefit. The other motivation, and actually this is the the physicists' uh, way to think about it is that there, the problem of quantum simulation itself, simulating a, a quantum system, is easier to do when you're doing that with a quantum system than it is with a classical system. And the intuition behind this statement is that it takes a lot of bits of information to encode something that nature seems to do very easily. So an example of this is uh, caffeine, the caffeine molecule which if you wanted to simulate exactly what the caffeine molecule is doing, what its structure looks like, if you wanted to do that exactly, that's beyond the power of any of our classical computers today. However, you'd imagine if you had a quantum system that you, you could configure in a way that mimics caffeine, then the evolution of your quantum system would in some way encode the evolution of caffeine. And so you might be able to gain more insight. So that gives you kind of a flavor of the kinds of problems that physicists might be interested in solving. I hope that that answers your question. It's a very, it's a very interesting thing to think about, but I don't think there's a specific set of things that one can say, this is what quantum computers work for, this is what they don't work for. There are specific fields where we've determined that classical computers are just as good, uh, but it's very difficult to find the cases where you can say, a quantum computer might be useful here without going through the exercise of finding something. Cool, thanks, Abe. Um, and then the next question, I think we might have two more if you have time for two questions right now. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is, what does the inverse of QPE do? Uh, it applies, very simply, uh, it applies the gates of QPE in reverse. Um, <laughs> this is an insight that, that can easily be gotten if you, um, 
if you take the lab from yesterday and just do QPE dagger and apply it on an initial state. Um, there's not much intuition to be gained by doing QPE inverse. Cool. And then I think the last question before we get back to the lecture is, in QPE, how many qubits do we need to have a good estimation of theta? Oh, that's a good question. Um, remember, the point of QPE was to find uh, theta, to estimate theta, and the output was 2 to the power of n times theta. So the answer of how many qubits do you need really depends on how small theta is and how precise you want to be. So if theta is a very small number, like 0 0.001, and for example, you want to read out things like things of order 1 and not 0 0.001, then you might want to multiply that number by 1,000, which means you would need a multiplier of 1,000, and 2 to the power of 10 is 1,000, roughly. So you need 10 qubits to solve that problem. But really, this is one of those questions where you can't just give a number of qubits that you need. You need to be given how much precision uh, is needed, and you need to be told what the error rate is. And then you can, you can determine how many qubits are necessary to do this estimation. Great. Um, it does look like people are continuing to upvote questions. Um, it looks like we can either continue with a couple of more, or if you'd like to continue with the lecture, I can leave it up to you. Uh, let's take a few more questions, yeah. OK. Um, next question would be, can we build a Fourier spectrum out of QFT? Yes, you can. Um, I will uh, link, OK, in today's lab, and in the Discord, I'll put a link to some really interesting things that you can do building out something that looks like a Fourier spectrum. It's not exactly a Fourier spectrum, but something that looks very similar using quantum Fourier transform. Uh, it's kind of very hard to explain um, in words, so it's probably better to share the reference. OK, so um, Abe, you'll share that in Discord? Yes, exactly. I'll take a note here. Great. Great. Um, on to another one. Can you please explain why Shor's algorithm doesn't work on classical computers? Can you please explain why Shor's algorithm doesn't work on classical computers? This is the perfect question. Um, <laughs> if you remember, Susie, I promised you I would be switching to my screen. Um, I'd yeah. like to do that right now and show people that you can, in fact, run Shor's algorithm on a classical computer. I'm going to do that right now. Great. All right. We'll take a break from the questions for now, and we can get back to them um, in, a, in another few minutes. Sure. OK. So you should be all set to share your screen, Abe. OK. Awesome. Do share screen. Uh, start sharing this screen. OK. Um, you should be able to see something that looks like a series of squiggly lines. Um, so this is, this is uh, a demo that I prepared for our discussion today. And what it's doing is taking n, in this case n is 15, and picking a number that is co-prime with n. In this case, in our discussion, we chose 13, so I'll just use 13. Uh, checking if the greatest common divisor between uh, a and n is 1. So that's, that's something that I've done. And because the greatest common divisor is 1, I can now do uh, the, the, the feature that I told you, a to the power of r modulo n, right? 13 to the power of z modulo 15 for different values of z. And you can see this is the form that the function takes. And you see the periodicity, right? Here's the periodicity. You're seeing 4 over here. So r is determined to be 4 from this work. And in fact, we check again. If r is even, I compute x. And if x plus 1 is not a modulo n is not equal to 0, then I print for you math.gcd. So I compute the GCD of x plus 1 and n and x minus 1 and n. It's literally as simple as that to write down um, the algorithm that we worked with. So here, um, x was 4, and the prime factors were determined to be 5 and 3. So I'll, I'll give you this demo, and I think it's a very useful um, exercise to play with it. So here what I've done is factor 15 
uh, by choosing these values. But another set of values that I prepared for us is maybe a number that looks like this. So n is 77 and a is uh, 18, the two are co-prime. So if we go through all of this, um, GCD tells us they are indeed co-prime. Uh, if you look for the periodicity, this is what the function looks like. Now, this is interesting, right? If I asked you to find the period of this function, it's, it's, it's quite hard, right? You can kind of see it. It's between here and here. Um, but the, the interesting insight that I want all of you to get from this is that when you see functions like this, remember, we discussed yesterday how hard it could be to, to find the period of a function. When you see things like this, it's, it may not be trivial to find the periodicity, but this is the goal of doing Shor's algorithm, to take advantage of um, quantum computers in order to find the period. So in this case, it turns out R is 30. So that's between this point and this point. So the period is this much, and then it repeats here, and then so on. And if you use that, what you get is a value of x to be 43, and the factors are immediately determined to be 11 and 7, OK? This is, this is great to see, and I hope it shows you uh, the simple case of factoring 15 is nice to work with by hand so that you can learn things. But these problems can get very complicated, and these periods can be um, quite difficult to find. So I hope that that gives you a bit more intuition and also answers your question of why can't we run Schwartz algorithm on a classical computer. This is running on my laptop right now using a simulator. So it's not, it's not that it can't run on a classical computer. It's more like you get the advantage of using a quantum computer because you're about to use QFT, which I haven't shown you yet, uh, in order to determine the period. Okay. Uh, if there are any questions, that's, uh, uh, this is a good time to take them regarding the demo. Otherwise, um, I can move on to other questions. Hey, Ed. Um, it doesn't look like there's been any follow-up questions. I'm looking at the chat. It doesn't look like anybody's following up on that question in particular. Um, okay, but if we want to answer some more questions, we can go ahead and do that. Does that sound okay? Yep, that sounds good. Okay, um, would it be correct to say the poles are in real space, the equatorial plane in K space, where positive and negative states lie in a block sphere? That's right, yeah, that, that is correct. Okay, easy question, love it. All right, um, understanding the algorithms and math is fine, but how on earth do you come up with such algorithms? What is the thinking process? <laughs> Uh, this is why Peter Shor is famous. Um, these insights are very difficult to come by. Um, and th this is also why there are very few crown jewel quantum algorithms in the field. This is also why we need all of you to start thinking about quantum algorithms and to maybe even come up with the next big Shor's algorithm type of contribution to the field. Cool. Um, I'm just trying to look for some, some relevant questions as well. Da, 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 da. All right, let's go for one or two more and then maybe we can continue with the lecture. Sure. Okay. In the QPE circuit, is it possible to just miss out the first Hadamard? Ooh, I lost it. Where'd it go? Oh, there. Oh. It is. In the QPE circuit, is it possible to just miss out the first Hadamard gates and input whatever control qubit inputs we want? Uh, is it possible to miss out the Hadamard gates? I'm not sure what that means. Um, I would say if you're not starting in the zero state, if you're starting in another state, there is a chance that you might actually collapse the Hadamard gates at front. So um, it's not obvious to me what uh, what is being asked, but you can uh, you can you can definitely remove the gates and see what QPE does. At the end of the day. That's just a well-defined protocol that you need to use in other building block quantum algorithms. Got it. Okay. If if the person that asked that question wants some more follow-up, please just input it into the questions and we can have it upvoted to answer. Yes, uh, and I do see some people. Yes, it is just a black screen. We just all stopped sharing our screens. So everybody is seeing a black screen right now. Yep. Um, Maybe we can bring the iPad up on display. We certainly can.
Thank you, Susie. You're welcome. All right, it looks like um, there are still a couple Shores algorithm questions, um, mm -hmm. but I would encourage us to get back to the lecture um, and let the folks continue to upvote and see if um, you know some other participants answer these questions like they've been doing. Excellent. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to, we're due for a break, so I want to set us up for a break. Uh, but before I do, I want to show you something uh, very interesting. So let's change color and maybe I'll choose green. So let's talk about, so all of these things that we discussed are really nice, but I think what we're here to do is build a quantum circuit in order to do all of this work. So let's uh, talk about the quantum circuit for factoring 15, at least. For factoring n equals p times q. Now, the circuit that I'm going to show you uh, is for n equals 15. When you go to larger numbers, there are some subtleties that we need to talk about. But for now, um, please follow along, and we can expand on those subtleties later on. So I'll explicitly say subtleties later. For now, follow along. So here's the quantum circuit for Shor's algorithm. You have already seen this circuit. That's the really cool part about the, the material that you've seen so far. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with, remember I said 15 in binary is one, 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 which is four bits. So I'm going to use four qubits here. And I'm going to start them all off in the zero state. And apply had a march to each of them. And I'm going to start another set of four qubits down here. And I will call these x. And for the purposes of our discussion today, I'll call these w. In the literature, you see kind of different names for it. But let's say this is also all zeros. So zero, 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 and zero. I'm going to then feed all of these qubits into a box, which I'll explain what it's doing in a moment, but it's a box that implements a function f, which takes in two arguments, a and n. And I'm sure you can guess what those a and n are already from our discussion. And then I'm going to take the top four qubits, and then I'm going to apply make a wild guess what's inside this box, a QFT dagger. And then I'm going to apply a measurement on these qubits. Uh, before I do all of this, so before I do any of the QFT on the top qubits, I'm going to draw a very bold line down here. I'm going to do a measurement of these bottom four qubits. So I'll put a meter here. This is also a meter. So this is the protocol for Shor's algorithm built out in quantum circuit form. And what I'm promising you is that this circuit can allow us to find the factors of n. So before uh, we go very, very deep into this discussion, let me just write down very quickly, f that takes in two numbers, a and n, is a function that for every x that you give it, computes a to the x, modulo n. And that's something that, that we've already seen uh, in terms of finding periodicity. But I think um, it's very clear that now that you know f, you can already get some hints about how this circuit works. And what we can do is take a break and come back and walk through the circuit line by line and figure out what the states are at each step.